let's start the session. So welcome everyone to um, a session or on systematic literature review. Um, and my name is Dr. Farooq Habib, and I will be delivering this session to you. So this is one of the methodologies that um, is used uh, in your re can be used in your research. So it's very practical and very much uh, relevant to your MSc dissertation. Uh, so uh, the first thing that we have to understand is this, that what is the difference uh, between uh, a traditional literature review and a systematic literature review? So systematic literature review, traditionally when we are doing literature review, uh, which is part of your second uh, chapter of your thesis. So generally we are conducting this based on some background information or discussion that we had with our supervisors, whereas a systematic literature review attempts to answer specific questions based on evidence in the literature. So that means that when you start a systematic literature review, you must have specific review questions that you will use to read the literature and find answers to those specific questions. So that's the first difference. The second thing is this, that traditional literature review is not very exhaustive. Exhaustive means it's not a very comprehensive way of approaching because it's like a random approach. It's more of an organic approach where you are trying to find articles which are relevant to your research. However, in systematic literature review, we attempt to identify and review, try to review all relevant studies. Uh, and uh, I will just uh, mention to you in the coming slides why we do it. So it's more comprehensive. That's the second point. The third point is this, that in traditional literature review, uh, let me use my pointers. Uh, in traditional literature review, we may not specifically aim to eliminate bias. However, the criteria that we use, quality criteria, and you will learn how to apply this quality criteria. This helps us avoid bias by establishing transparency in our research. So one of the key highlights of a systematic literature review is this. It is an unbiased uh, approach. So as you know, that bias uh, means that you are you are inclined to in include a certain type of papers. So this unbiased approach basically is more objective and tries to eliminate any kind of subjectivity in the selection process. Uh, traditional literature review doesn't document the search process. However, one of the hallmarks of a systematic literature review is that every uh, the whole process is documented. So this documented documentation brings transparency to your system to your approach and also repeatability. So transparency and repeatability, you can say these are the two uh, major reasons why we conduct a systematic literature review. Transparency basically means that everything is well documented. So there is no ambiguity how you conducted this research so every, because everything is documented and because everything is clearly stated. So repeatability basically means that once you have graduated from the university and you are working in your professional career, and maybe in the coming few months or few years, if another student comes in and they want to continue doing research in your area, they can use the information that you have provided in your methodology chapter and they can conduct similar research for their thesis as well. As you know, mo most of the content which is uploaded on the uh, on on the Internet is there is so much content that is uploaded all the time that uh, you know, even if you do the research after a few months, you might find some new articles in addition to the ones that you included in your research previously. So it, it, it doesn't it, uh, generate the same number of articles, same articles, but similar articles. And the last point is this, that uh, a traditional literature review approach doesn't explain why the studies were included. The studies that you included in your research were selected. Uh, however, in a systematic literature review, it is completely different because here you apply a two stage quality control to ensure that high quality, only high quality articles are included and poor quality articles are excluded. So one of the ways in which you can demonstrate your the quality of your work is world class or high class is that you include those articles which meet your quality criteria. So these are some of the starting thoughts of why we go into systematic literature review. So systematic literature review, as you know, has uh, five distinct stages. And today's session basically is designed to explain to you what are those five stages. 
So this methodology, remember systematic literature review is a methodology to review the literature. So if somebody asks you what is a systematic literature review, you will say it's a methodology to review the literature. When we say review the literature, that means that we are reviewing that literature which is currently available in public domain. So it has five stages and there are 10 steps which as you can see on the right hand side, 10 steps which are, uh, you know, uh, divided into these five stages. So main st stages are planning, searching, screening, extraction and synthesis and reporting. So when you are going to uh, adopt this type of methodology for your uh, for your thesis, this uh, approach primarily is based on secondary qualitative data. All right. So this is primarily focused on secondary data. So you don't need to do any interviews. You don't need to do any uh, surveys. You only review your entire thesis is based on the review of current literature that is available in public domain. So this particular approach is primarily designed for secondary database research. So this is very useful, especially for those type of topics where you find it very difficult to access uh, people working in the industry. Uh, like, for example, people who are working in, say, for example, in supply chain management. So they find it very difficult to get access to people who are working in the industry, because as you know, that uh, some area require subject specialists, people who have a certain level of knowledge to answer your interview questions or your survey questions in at the data collection stage of your MSc thesis. Similarly, there are certain uh, sensitive topics, like for instance, if you are conducting research which uh, involves uh, vulnerable adults, like for instance, in the healthcare sector. So vulnerable adults are those which require some sort of assistance before they have to answer your questions. Or maybe if you are uh, interviewing some people who are, say for instance, uh, you know, like small children. So again, small children, you cannot do research and uh, you cannot do research on small children through primary data because uh, very difficult to get permission from the university or also their parents. So these are some of the things. Uh, these are some of the difficult topics or it is sometimes possible that the topic is very sensitive because of its nature. Like, for example, if you are looking at defense industry, so defense industry, as you know, is of strategic importance and nobody is going to give you an interview from the defense industry to answer your questions. Uh, or it sometimes it also happens that uh, your topic is so new. Uh, it is so it is uh, a latest topic about which very few people have the knowledge on how to answer those questions. So that's also quite possible that, uh, you know, you uh, don't have the uh, you cannot access enough people to collect the data for your research. So this type of approach helps uh, students in those type of situations where it is very difficult to get access to the right type of respondent uh, that is uh, that has have the relevant knowledge in your area. So that's why it's a it's a very useful, uh, you know, approach in, for those uh, sensitive uh, situations, even though also those students who are doing research on project management. So project management, again, uh, very difficult to get access to knowledgeable people. And as you know that in many organizations, you have to get a non-disclosure agreement signed between the university and the company. And sometimes it, NDA non-disclosure agreement takes sometimes months, sometimes uh, weeks, sometimes months to get signed and uh, it can delay your research. So this type of research is very useful in that sense. So a bit of history about systematic literature review. So this methodology, number one, is not very new. It's not a new methodology. It's a tried and tested methodology which has been used by different authors uh, for many, many years, maybe 40, 50 years now. So this systematic literature review was initially used in by people who are working in the field of medicine in medical sciences, because when you are doing research as a doctor or as a as a scientist working in the healthcare sector, uh, the last thing you want is that when you publish your work in a journal, Say, for example, you are talking about the side effects of a medicine. Uh, you know, somebody points out that, you know, you left out a big chunk of literature uh, which you should have included in your research. Because if you leave out some literature which talks about those side effects of medicine, which you did not account for, you know, it is possible, you know, God forbid that somebody takes your medicine 
uh, you know they follow your research they produce medicine they sell it in the market and somebody takes that medicine and it, it can help uh, have uh, consequences on their health so that's why this systematic literature review was adopted by medical sciences so that you have a comprehensive review of the literature but over the years what happens is this that and uh, that in 2003 uh, these uh, three authors from cranfield university they actually uh, take uh, the credit for bringing this methodology into social sciences. So all of you who are, you know, are listening to this uh, presentation, you are basically social scientists. So you are looking at, uh, you know, uh, all the uh, issues that are faced by uh, society from different angles. Some of you are from marketing, some of you are from finance, some from operations, some from project management and accounting and uh, human resource. Uh, and um, so and some from supply chain management. So there are there's a group of students which are looking at social, uh, you know, uh, sciences. So this methodology was first used in social sciences this in 2003 by this groundbreaking article. So when I send you the uh, the slides, which I'm showing to you right now in the at the end, you will also find in the reference list this article uh, that was uh, that we still use as a very good reference for uh, saying that how, why we are using systematic literature review in our approach, in, the, in our research. So this uh, article that I just showed to you, uh, and I'll use, the, I'll use the acronym SLR, which is uh, an, a short word for systematic literature review an acronym. So this was introduced uh, by uh, Tranfield et al. in 2003, and then David Denier, uh, uh, and Cranfield, they published in 2009. So I can take pride in saying that my I have been taught how to do systematic literature review by David Denier himself when I was doing my PhD. So a systematic lit so officially, if I want to define to you what is a systematic literature, this is what you can use this as a definition. That a systematic literature review is a methodology which provides a comprehensive coverage of the literature and ensures comparability for repeated future research. So that's basically the definition of what is a systematic literature review methodology. This methodology has 10 steps, as I mentioned to you earlier, which are divided in these five phases. So today what we are going to do is, and this is the agenda for today, that I'm going to go through these five stages um, and uh, just uh, give you an idea of what is the requirement for you to follow for each of these uh, 10 steps. So step one, as you know, uh, in sorry, stage one, as you know, is the planning stage. So planning stage has uh, so in planning stage, uh, we've got, uh, as you can see, in planning stage, we've got these three steps. Number one is forming the review panel. Number two is mapping of the field. And number three is to produce a review protocol. These are the three steps which are in the planning stage. So most of the work that you do in your introduction chapter of your MSc thesis is based on this step. So first of all, what you are going to do in the planning stage is to form a review panel. In your case, review panels basically are advisory groups or panels uh, that are formed um, that provide the reviewer with the guidance and support. So if you guys adopt the systematic literature review approach, you are going to be the reviewer. Your role in this uh, would be of a reviewer that reviewer basically means the person who's going to review the literature and this literature that we are reviewing this is that literature which is available in the public domain so the review panel will generally consist of the review panel uh, can be consulted individually or as a group uh, throughout the review uh, these generally include subject experts from academia and practice uh, so generally, uh, for MSc students in your uh, in your review panel, uh, it will have uh, generally three people are in the review panel. Number one, it is going to be you yourself. Then it's going to be your supervisor, who is a, a subject expert, and the third person would be somebody from the library, like an information scientist, who is going to help you or guide you how to access different types of databases. So generally, that's a review panel that you are going to form. If you go into practical life and as consultants, we also do this type of work for many clients. When we are working in the industry, that they ask us to review the literature and tell, tell us what's the new thing that is available in the literature. In that case, 
you will also include in this review panel maybe somebody who's an expert from the industry so the purpose of the review panel is to help you as a student and guide you through the process throughout your msc uh, journey that's the basic reason of this review panel they are here to support you so again i'll just uh, repeat for review panel it's going to be you you are going to head the review panel and you are going to be supported by your msc thesis supervisor and also uh, information scientists from the library who are going to help you in accessing different types of databases so that's step one step two basically is mapping the field of study so we also call it framing of the business problem which you can see on the right hand side so framing of the business problem basically means that literally you are putting a picture frame like you put a picture frame around the picture that you have so it basically tells the audience that anything which is inside the frame that's basically what you are going to be looking at in your research and anything which is outside this box that you can see that is not included in your research so this is what we call this 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 outline that you can see that's what we call as frame it's like a picture frame framing of the business problem or in other words we call it mapping of the field of study so what it shows is this that generally these are the bodies of literature or domains of knowledge that you are going to look at which are related to your topic so when you are going to be studying your uh, uh, research methodology uh, uh, modules there your tutor uh, will help you in developing your research topics so the title of your research topic will help you identify these uh, these three uh, terminologies that are available in this in these circles so your topic will be the overlap of all these three circles right in the middle that's your research topic and your research context will be mentioned on the lower right hand side like for example if you are looking at uk retail sector that that would be the research context of your work now the thing is this that please remember that research context is not put inside the circles so that would be a mistake uh, research context is always outside which actually shows that when you are reviewing the literature your research is not context specific like for example if you are trying to look at say for example uh, you know you are trying to look at uh, say impact of digital technologies on um, uh, say for instance uh, consumer uh, brand loyalty uh, you know uh, in the uk retail sector so that means that the issue that you are looking at is the impact of digital tech technologies on uh, you know uh, consumer uh, brand behavior or consumer loyalty that is the issue you, you are focusing on that's your research topic so when you are going to do research that is not going to be limited to just uk retail sector so context if you find some articles which are on uk retail sector that's great that's like you've hit the jackpot or you it's like a cherry on top but primarily the research is not restricted to uh, only the context written here so that's the beauty of slr because uh, normally when i'm uh, you know guiding my students uh, for their slr i normally ask them to do a multiple sector uh, research uh, because that actually helps students look at different types of sector different challenges and make a cross sector comparison also like for example if you want to look at impact of digital technologies on brand loyalty for instance then you can make a cross comparison between uh, you know uh, retail sector and within retail sector you can look at uh, you know fashion retail or uh, you could look at electronics grocery food retail uh, and uh, so forth so you can make a cross sector comparison very easily whereas when you are doing primary based database research like for instance uh, like doing interviews or survey then you are restricted that you cannot collect data from people who are outside your context so that's basically another very big advantage of systematic literature review that you have a lot of flexibility as far as your research context is concerned uh, and of course as i mentioned to you earlier the, yes if you can get some articles which are specific to the research context that's great uh, but generally we are looking at the issue and not the context also in, in this stage you must also remember that sometimes it is possible that you are doing research say for example on the retail sector 
but you can learn examples from other sectors also like for example it could be a banking sector it could be manufacturing sector uh, it could be food processing sector uh, you know so you can go beyond the sector also as long as the issue is uh, the same that you are focusing on but this is step number 2 which is mapping of the field so generally when we are asking our students to conduct a systematic literature review you are expected to have around 60 to 65 articles 60 to 70 articles as part of your systematic literature review because you see that is the raw material that you are going to use to write your thesis so that's basically between 60 to 70 articles normally my students normally aim for about 60 to 65 articles uh, you know that uh, the reason why we have kept this bar so high uh, is that uh, you have to demonstrate that you have been comprehensive enough in your thesis at the msc level you see so at msc level you have to demonstrate that you have put the necessary rigor and effort in your work to cover the field comprehensively that's why so what you do is if you have say for example 60 articles so as you can see there are four overlapping areas this is the first overlapping area this is the second uh, this is the the third overlapping area and this is the fourth overlapping area so that means if you divide the 60 articles by 4 that means you need about only 15 articles uh, in each of the four overlapping area which is not that bad uh, because if getting 15 articles is not that uh, is uh, not that difficult yes that's the bare minimum number of articles uh that uh, are generally accepted at the msc level so uh my, some of my students have even gone up to 80 90 articles when i did my own systematic literature review based uh, msc i had 125 articles so i'm being gentle to you by saying 60 is all right all right so you know it's not that much so basically you will divide the articles into these four uh dimensions uh which are basically these four overlapping areas uh so that's the second step and the third step which is actually very important i uh, just uh, for those people who are joining us we are basically going through these uh uh 10 uh, steps of uh, systematic literature review so i've just covered step 1 and 2 uh, forming of the review panel and mapping of the field and now i'm discussing step number 3 which is producing a review protocol so review protocol basically is very important step and uh, uh, when you are going to be writing about your uh, uh when you are going to be writing about your uh when you are choosing a, a topic of your research you are going to first of all you are going to write a problem statement this is part of the review protocol so you are going to provide a problem statement problem statement basically means why your topic is relevant for the industry uh which means that what is the benefit that the industry is going to get from your topic so whenever you try whenever you are trying to select a topic for your research always remember that it must show the uh the industrial relevance why is it important for the industry that is the problem statement uh, sometimes it happens that uh you know there is an opportunity out there and you have been working in an industry and you feel that uh you know there is a certain opportunity out there uh, which your company hasn't really benefited from so then in that case it would we will call that as uh opportunity statement so sometimes it's a problem driven issue uh, a problem driven uh, research topic sometimes it can be opportunity driven uh, research topic i remember one of my students uh, you know uh, from uh, your campus northumbria campus he was doing research he was from nigeria and they wanted to set up a diaspora based uh, uh, you know um, a tourism uh, industry uh, tourism uh, you know uh, a company which uh, offered di diaspora based uh, uh, tourism opportunities so that means that those uh, uh, people who were from nigeria but were located across the world uh, if they wanted to bring their you know family or children to visit nigeria what were the kind of tourism opportunities uh, that would be available so that means that in those type of situations uh, that was a topic that was driven by an opportunity 
so it's up to you it can be a problem driven but it can be uh, uh, also uh, opportunity driven so that's the first thing in the problem statement the second thing is this that you have to provide a recent referenced industrial example as a supporting evidence to demonstrate that why the industry is still struggling to solve that problem so this is very important that this problem that you are going to use as an evidence remember this when we are doing research we say you are doing evidence based research so any kind of evidence that you can provide to support your arguments will always be welcomed and it will translate into a higher quality uh, work that you will be submitting so uh, you know for your case because uh, you are going to provide an evidence to support why you have selected the topic it must be an example from an existing company in 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 real life which is currently facing that problem so for example if you are doing a research in 2022 ideal, ideally your, the the example that you are going to be providing should also be from 2022 or maybe maximum 2021 because it has to be a recent problem right you can't say in 2022 the currently the companies are facing a problem and then you give a reference of 2010 which was 12 years ago so and as you know because of pandemic in the last 2 3 years the complete uh, all companies have completely faced uh, you know have changed their business models to a large extent so in in, in any case uh, examples which are even before the start of the pandemic might not be relevant right now so you must provide a recent example and uh, this section is your problem statement section then you are going to finalize your research objectives and questions so these basically these are your objectives that you would like to uh, you know uh, me uh, uh, you would like to these are the objectives of your thesis basically of your research so these research objectives would uh, then be uh, would also have these questions so these questions basically are your review questions uh slash research question but in case of systematic literature review these questions are called review questions although i have used the word research question not to uh, you know not to get confused uh, but uh, technically what happens is this that these are those questions that you are going to ask from the literature and you are going to find the answers to these questions so once you find the answers to these questions that means you would have met your research objectives and once you would have met your research objectives that means you have have completed your thesis so that's why we say normally the instructions are that research ob objective must be equal to research questions uh, so normally i expect the students to have about four to five objectives and about and matching questions so you must have a matching research question so one of the mistakes students make is this that they would have three objectives and four questions or maybe five objectives and three questions so every objective must have a matching research question so the reason why we say 4 to 5 because you know if you have a 4000 word uh, literature review section if you divide it by say five objectives you have to write about 800 words in your literature review section when you go to findings if it's a 4000 word section you again have to write 800 words about each objectives if you have fewer objectives maybe if you have two objectives then you would have to write 2000 words about each objective which can be quite taxing or if you have eight or 10 objective that you have to just small sections are there 400 words which doesn't demonstrate the depth of knowledge that you want to demonstrate at uh, at the msc level so that's why we say four to five objectives are all right but definitely when you go into your msc thesis level this you have to discuss with your, the appointed supervisor they are a subject specialist and they will guide you here so this is uh, we have a flexibility there so that's the second thing you have to do as part of step number 3 and the third thing is that you have to develop a search strategy so search strategy basically is the protocol or the steps that you are going to follow to select the articles so here you are going to talk about the study selection criteria how you are going to select the articles uh, then the second one is that how will you uh, ensure that uh, that quality Uh, what quality criteria you will use to assess the quality of the articles and i'm going to show you some quality criteria also uh, what will be the data extraction procedure you are going to follow and what will be the data synthesis procedure you are going to follow which is generally going to be based on thematic analysis based on research objectives so we are going to discuss all these in the coming slides 
but this is generally a, you know this will be your initial uh, thoughts that you will put in place and you will get them checked from your supervisor so that you have some plan in uh, in place uh, but we do have the flexibility that as you are moving forward and as your thinking is evolving these will become you will improve these initial thoughts and then you have got a project timeline so project timetable basically means that what is the start and end date of your project uh, so in your case it is predefined because you will already know when the module is starting and when is the submission deadline so in your case it is very specific when you go into practical life uh, or in your professional role if you are doing research for a company they will ask you what time how much time it takes uh, uh, will you, you will take to complete the project so in your case you will decide there but at, at an M academic level at M an msc level uh, your submission de deadline is actually the last date of your project so then we go to the second stage which is the searching stage so searching basically means that you are trying to find out those 60 to 70 articles that are relevant for your research remember when we are searching articles we, are, we always must keep these three circles in mind and also remember that these three circles can be two circles, they can be four circles, but generally they, they are between two and four circles, depending on what is the kind of topic that you have selected. So that's basically some of the keywords that you will be using to search articles will be, should be in these circles. And these, uh, the, the keywords that you see in these circles, generally they will come from the title of your research. So that's just keep that in mind. So stage two basically is the searching stage. Uh, just to uh, give you a perspective where we are so far. So as you know that we have covered the planning stage where we took look, looked at three steps. And now we are in the searching stage, which is the step number four, uh, which means conducting a systematic search. So this is now we are covering in, in this slide. So step, step number four basically is uh, part of uh, stage two, which is searching. So uh, here you are going to uh, be preparing for this. This step four basically will also uh, be very useful for writing your methodology section. So this is basically from where your methodology section will uh, be written. So you will need to explain every step of your research. So you will document it. So you need to make detailed notes of everything you did uh, you did and why and what uh, your uh, thought process was so that's basically you have to document it and this will contribute towards transparency or, and repeatability of your approach so now the thing is this that when we are going to conduct this research you must know about some of these uh, very useful tools that you can use to find the right articles so we call them wildcards. So wildcards basically are useful to find words with different variants. Uh, variants mean variation. So there are two types of wildcards that we, we use in the research. Number one is the end word wildcard, which is an asterisk, uh, which as you can see a tiny asterisk, this one, uh, which appears after the stem of the word. Like for example, if you put it at the end of the word manage, this word this letter word shown in the red color, this is your stem of the word. So if you put asterisk here, it will find all. So when you search for these uh, the, the articles, uh, it will find all those articles which have the word manage, manager, managers, management. So instead of writing all these words separately, if you just put the asterisk, that will cover all these words. Uh, similarly, if you put uh, the mid word wildcard, so mid world white card basically is that you put it as a question mark. So especially where you have British English and American English, you know that in British English, we spell organization with an S and in American English, it is uh, uh, spelled with a Z. So if you put a question mark in, in that place where you had to put S or Z, it will cover those articles which use the word organization and organization both. So that's very useful because we, when we are conducting research, generally most of the research that we are looking at is uh, either done in, uh, you know, uh, is done in English speaking countries because we are, that is one of the criteria that we'll be using. So this will cover all those articles which use different variations. 
so you can also use a combination of end wild word wildcard and uh, mid word wildcard. Uh, so you can put a question mark and an asterisk. So in this way, you will see that it will cover words like organization, organizations, organizational, and uh, the variations of these uh, words. So that's also very useful because uh, remember why we are using these uh, because they help you conduct a very comprehensive research. So the last thing you want is that when you are doing research on organizations, you don't if you don't put this, it might miss out on all those articles which talked about organization. Uh, say for example in uh, in uh, you know in UK, in UK English and uh, American English is included so just to be to be on the safe side that's why we use these wild cards so and then of course we also have to remember about the boolean connectors so boolean connectors are words which help you connect uh, different uh, strings of words with each other uh, so as you know that uh, uh, this is uh, so and basically is like a condition that you are putting in. Uh, so you're asking all articles with all of your terms in the record. So and is like a condition. Uh, and uh, so only those articles will be selected, which select which have this which meet this and condition. So you this by putting this word and you will exclude any papers which don't have all of the terms in your default search strings. Like, for example, when you wanted to come to do, if you wanted to do an MSc, you say, okay, I want to do an MSc. And so you will, if you just put MSc, you know, universities which are, offer MSc, that they, you will get thousands of universities across the globe. And then you will say, and in UK, then you probably will get maybe 2,000 universities. And then you say, and in London, then you have maybe, I don't know, 100 universities. And then you say, and uh, on Liverpool Street, then maybe you get two. Uh, universities and then you say sorry uh, Middlesex Street and then you say and uh, you know 110 Middlesex Street so you get to Northumbria campus so this means that and basically is a condition is a word which actually helps you minimize the number of articles so if you are getting too many articles when you are putting the words that means that and will help you reduce the number of articles so and is like a condition you are putting in that I want to like for example, when you are doing job research, right? Your job search. So you say, I want to work in in IT sector and in UK. You know, so maybe you get uh, you know thousands of jobs, and then you say, and I want a salary of uh, you know uh, sixty thousand pounds. So your number of jobs will reduce. And you say, I only want want to work for maybe three days a week. You know, so maybe you get one job or maybe no job. So be very careful with the use of word and. Because and actually can also, you know, uh, eliminate all articles. Sometimes if you put too many conditions. Uh, I remember I had a student and uh, she was doing search and she was getting maybe only two or three articles where she wanted to look at about 60, 70 articles. And uh, the reason when I looked at the search string, uh, they had put too many conditions there. So if you have, if you want to get, if you are getting very few articles, that means maybe you need to be more flexible in your approach and maybe reduce uh, some of the conditions that you might have added in your research. Uh, so that's basically what the function of AND is. So the opposite of AND is the Boolean connector OR. So OR basically is a, a, a Boolean connector. Uh, remember, Boolean connector is a word which actually connects words together. So like, for example, if you look at the last line, you'll say risk OR vulnerable OR resilient OR robust. So it's basically looking at those articles which are, uh, you know, using these words. So, for example, if you say, okay, I want to do an MSc in project management, uh, you don't get many options in UK, for instance, you say, or in marketing, or in finance, or in operation, uh, human resource management, then your choice become starts increasing. So, or basically increases the choice and, and basically decreases the number of articles you are selecting. So, or uh, is uh, so so the thing is this when you are going to use the word or you have to use the words which are synonymous so synonymous words mean they are words which have the similar meaning all right uh, so like for example when you are going to say uh, like uh, when you are looking at uh, purchasing the synonymous could be procurement uh, it could be buying or sourcing 
these are all words which are uh, you know uh, synonymous means words with similar meanings or if you are using the word management then synonymous could be you know uh, management it could be evaluating uh, managing evaluating appraising assessing identifying uh, you know controlling all these uh, words are synonymous words so uh, this is these are the words you can use uh, exactly organizing so all these words you can use so now you have to decide that when uh, you know to use and and or and i will give you an example also in the coming slides but generally if you are getting 10000 results and that is too many so you need to check your synonyms uh, sometimes uh, you might want to remove any synonyms that are too broad and also you need to check your operators uh, check whether you have got an or where you should have an and uh, sometimes you get very few results only 20 results uh, especially if you are looking at very new or novel uh, you know latest topics you might not get many articles uh, you know, so that is also something, uh, uh, an issue that, so the things that you have to check if you're getting very few articles is that are any of your search terms too precise? Uh, you have to check your operators. Uh, have you got an and when you should have an or? So this is a very common mistake that people put or where they need to put an and uh, and be prepared to broaden the search. If you get very few articles, maybe you need to put some synonyms there, words with similar meanings. So generally, the basic idea is this, that you have about, if you do a search, maybe you get, you know, like 2000 articles in general. So then you will quickly read the title of the article only and bring the number of articles down to about 200 articles. You know, you get rid of the articles. Once you got to about 200 articles, then you will read the abstract only, not the full article you will read the abstract only and you will bring the number of as you know abstract is a small paragraph in the beginning of the article uh, which summarizes what is inside the article so then from 200 articles you will bring it down to about i would say 80 to 100 articles 80 article is not bad but reaching 80 articles you have only read the title brought the number of articles down to about 200 and then you have read the abstract and brought the articles down to about 80 articles and then you will read about or maybe 75 to 80 articles and then you will quickly scan the article you know apply the quality criteria and bring the number of articles down to 60 articles so that's the process sometimes what students do with this they start reading the full article if, you, if they have say for example 1500 articles they start reading the full article so that's going to take you a long, long time and your MSc uh, deadline is going to pass. So uh, the first thing is to read the title and get rid of the articles, especially those articles which are not related to your work. So title is just a line. So it will not take you much time and you can quickly bring the article down to about 200. Then abstract is just a paragraph. If you read that, that's not going to take you much time and you can eliminate lots of articles there and bring them down to about 80 articles and then you quickly scan the uh, paper like you are reading a newspaper uh, you don't have to spend hours on that paper and then you will bring it down to about uh, about 60 articles that's a quick scan of the article you're not reading the article in detail once you've got those, those 60 articles then you will start uh, your data extraction process with, in which of course you have to read the article in more detail so that's generally the overall picture so this is how you uh, build your search strings. What I've just explained to you, this is how you will do it. So you will have some keywords at the top, like this guy was doing research on uh, buyer supplier interactions. So the keywords come from the title of your research. Your research title will have three, three or four keywords that you will put at the top of this table. As you can see, they put these three uh, keywords, buyer supplier interaction under buyer then you can see that they have these words with similar meanings. Like for buyer, they said buyer, customer, purchase or source. And you can see the Boolean connector or is located inside the column. So when you use this type of uh, combination of words, 
So the search engine like Google Scholar or EBSCO or ProQuest or Scopus, they basically search those articles which use one of these words, any one of these words uh, that it is used in, in the article, it will select that article for you. And as you can see, they, they've used the end wildcard. Can you see end wildcard? So this will look at buyer, buyers, customer or customers or source or sourcing or sources. So this is the first condition that has to be met before the article is shortlisted for you. So once that those articles are shortlisted, then the second condition will be applied to those shortlisted articles. And remember is the Boolean connector which shortlists the articles. So this and then it goes to the second bucket. So in the same article, which these articles, for example, it will then apply the second condition which has supplier, the word supplier in it or suppliers or seller or seller or vendor or vendors, then this second condition has to be met. So only those articles will move to the third stage, which meet these two conditions. And then the third stage is this, that uh, the final stage of the selection of the article, which will include these words. So interaction basically means interaction means when companies are working with each other, they are interacting with each other. So the words which come from the literature are collaboration or adversarial. Remember, interaction can be positive. It can be negative also. You know, people can be, you know, uh, competing with each other, which can be adversarial adversaries or they can be collaborating. It could be an alliance. It could be a partnership. Uh, this is basically uh, a balanced uh, approach. Uh, bargaining can be happening between two companies it can be negotiations it could be relationship they have or cooperation or they can be working in a network so these are key words which are generally found from the literature so that's basically uh, what we uh, call as uh, the words with similar meanings or synonyms so then only those articles will appear in front of you which have met the first condition then they have met the second condition and third one they have met the third condition so that's why what I was saying is that if you keep on adding the word and you will probably have so many conditions that you will get very few articles. So that's why we have a nice combination of and and or going together because or actually expands the number of articles and and reduces the number of articles. So a nice combination you can use, uh, you know, for selecting the articles. It is quite possible that, uh, you know, if uh, you just want to test how many are whether these words are actually effective or not that you just remove one word and see how many articles are left. So if you get any, if the change is not that significant, then you can get rid of some of the words which are not required. It is possible that, you know, they try not to use unnecessary words. That's the meaning because sometimes, uh, you know, the words attract uh, articles which are not related to your work. Like, for example, uh, can you see this one? Uh, and not and not basically is a third boolean connector and not basically helps you eliminate those articles which are not related to your work like these guys are looking at network so they are not interested in electricity networks or uh, you know computer networks uh, or any kind of health uh, network so they are trying to get rid of or multimedia network so they are trying to get rid of those articles which are not related to your research so it is quite possible that if you're getting strange kind of articles which are not related to your area, then you can use the This is another third Boolean connector is and not. So uh, this and not will help you eliminate those articles which are not related to your area. So sometimes it happens you are getting articles which are related to the field of uh, pure sciences like physics, chemistry, or they are related to a law, you know, legal side. So you're not interested in that. So you might want to get rid of those terms which are appearing unnecessarily in your research. So and not actually helps you eliminate those unnecessary terms which are not related to your work. So we always encourage our students to create a table first because table actually helps you cor make corrections to your mistakes. So for example, if you have a buyer, then you cannot put a supplier here because supplier has to be here. Right. So buyer and supplier are not synonyms. They are basically opposite words or antonyms, so they will not appear here. So that's why this table actually, this table must be checked by you first and then by your supervisor 
because this is where the mistake is made most commonly in systematic literature review. If you get the wrong words here, you will get the wrong number of articles. So if you are having trouble in getting to the right articles, I would my advice to you is always consult with your supervisor because uh, they are subject specialists and they will help you identify the right number of, uh, you know, articles, uh, the words that are used in uh, uh, that you require for your uh, research. So let me just uh, show you one more thing. I'm just going to show you an article. So this is one of my own articles, so which has done systematic literature review. So this followed a system. So if you if you look at the abstract, generally you will find the keywords which are stated here underneath the, the abstract. So this is a very good way of finding words which are suitable for your for your search. All right, so as you can see, you will find some words which are uh, relevant to your work. And as you can see in my article, as I mentioned, I just showed to you that now you will see the similar table that I just showed to you. So I used it like this one. So this is how you develop your search strings. You've got the buyer, supplier interactions. And, uh, and this is basically the example that I showed to you in my presentation. Uh, similarly, if you look at another article, which I will send these articles to you also. These are very good articles, which are normally used for this. This is an article from my supervisor, uh, which is uh, again on how to do a systematic literature review. So if you look at the abstract, Underneath the abstract again, you will find the keywords. Can you see the keywords given here? So if you uh, if you are struggling to find the words which are relevant to your research topic, this perhaps would be a nice way to start looking at those words underneath the abstract. All right. So this is an excellent article which talks about if you look at uh, the systematic. The reason I'm showing you these general articles is to give you confidence that this methodology is published methodology. So it is not just coming out of the thin air. This is published methodology, which is worldwide accepted. So can you see the five steps which are mentioned here? Planning, searching, screening, extraction, and synthesis and reporting. So that's uh, basically uh, what we are discussing. So I just uh, showed to you planning and searching. So searching is, and you can see, they are also talking about these three Boolean connectors, and, or, and, and not they explain to you how to uh, you know construct so if you want to read about it you can see how to read about uh, developing each section and if you go into this article you will again see the same table appearing that I just showed to you on where you have got uh, uh, can you see this one uh, keyword use search term so normally what we do is this that generally the terms come from the title and then uh, you can add those words which are uh, have the similar meaning. So they are looking at, say, for example, network, alliance, consortium, partner, collaboration. Uh, and uh, then they look at the second one, supply or procurement chain or vertical and governance or control or coordination, decision, norms or contracts. So and some things which are not really relevant, they use the and not and get rid of those. So, so this table is absolutely vital. I, I would say it is I normally when I'm doing supervising my students, I make it compulsory that this table must be there. So I will show you a very interesting thing now.
it's a it's a sample uh, thesis just to show you for us from the student point of view sometimes it is very important to see how a student has applied because what i am showing to you these are actually uh, general articles which are like world class work so uh, it is important for students to understand how to take the next step you know at the at the msc level before they take it to the national or international level so i'm just uh, I'm going to share a, a, a you know a msc thesis uh, on the screen with you which actually shows you that once you have created this table that i was showing to you how this table is then converted into a search string okay so that would be the second step that you have to understand how to convert in uh, you know a table into a search string sometimes student make this mistake that they start making search strings directly so that's not advisable as you can see from these two examples that i showed to you that ideally you must have a separate uh, you know a table that will help you uh, Uh, convert so just hang on i'm just uh, uploading that's why you lost the ppt it, it is not lost it has deliberately been taken off so So as you can see this methodology chapter, as I showed to you, you will start with an introduction section, then you will look at systematic literature review. What is a systematic literature review? Then you will form your review panel. Then you will define your search terms. Search terms come from your title of your research. You will define the terms. These are your three bubbles that I mentioned to you, the three bubbles. And this student is doing a multiple cross sector comparison looking at 3pl automotive pharmaceutical retail or fmcg then this is the, the the point that i wanted to show to you can you see their table that they have a keywords are disruptive supply chain and the sector so these are basically their keywords so once they have created these keywords then this is how they convert the keyword into the search string so search string is written underneath the table that's the search string. So this you will copy paste and you will put in the search bar of your search engine and you will get the articles. So as you can see the first bracket disrupt or trend or future or horizon or innovative which is given here. This first bracket. This first bracket is based on this first column. So everything which is in the first column. All this this is put in a bracket and this bracket is shown here. Then you have the AND, which is the Boolean connector AND. So this Boolean connector then goes and it appears after the bracket AND. And then the second bracket starts supply chain or demand chain or value chain or supply network, which is basically your second column. Sorry, your third column, this one. This All these words are put in one bracket and then you put them in the second bracket. And the, the Boolean connector AND appears. This is the AND. And this is then used after the second bracket. And and then because this student was doing multiple, uh, you know, sector work. So they were looking at pharmaceutical, for example, first and then automotive and then chemical and so on and so forth. So then they put the pharma here and they put and and then they have put farm and then the asterisk which covers pharma, pharmaceutical, pharma, pharma, pharmacists everything is covered here so this is how you make a search string which is based on this table so normally students make this mistake that they start making this search string directly without this table which means that if there is a mistake made it cannot be detected so the the benefit of having this table is this that it helps you protect it protects you from making that mistake that is the that is the reason so i just wanted to show to you an example so at least you have an idea of how to present uh, that mistake from happening. So that's basically where we were. Uh, so 
based on this table that I have shown to you in my presentation, this table, which you can see, what I've done is this, I've also created the search string for you, which is based on this table. So as you can see, you got the first uh, bracket and uh, it is based on all the terms which are in the first column, buyer or customer or purchase or source, all these are here. Then you have your Boolean connector and, and then the second bracket starts, which has these three terms. Then you have the third and, and second and, and then the third column, which is the longer one. And you got all these terms here. And then you can also put and not and and not comes here. And then you have all these terms in that. So that's basically, uh, you know, this is very important for you to learn how to convert. So first step uh, is to find the keywords. Keywords will generally come from your uh, from your uh, title of your research. Second step is to find words with similar meanings and put them underneath the word with or in between. And you can put the uh, wild cards also there. Uh, if you are getting too many articles, get rid of the wild cards. Okay, that is also one way of uh, wild cards actually increase the number of articles. By the way, so if you want, if you are getting too many articles, try to go ahead just without the wild cards and then see how many articles you get. As I mentioned to you earlier, ideally you should, in your first search, you must get ideally target about 1500 to 2000 articles, because uh, if you get too many articles, you you will not be able to read all the titles. In most cases, you will get about uh, 1500 to 2000 articles, then you will only reach read the title and bring them to 200 articles, then read the abstract, bring them down to 80, then apply quality criteria and bring them to 60. So that's basically, uh, you know, this. So first step is to find the keywords. Second step is to find words with similar meanings. And the third step basically is to convert those tables into your search string. So this search string there basically then you can copy paste it into different, uh, uh, you know, search, uh, you know, engines and get the articles. So when we are uh, using uh, uh, this is also uh, what I've just explained to you in, in writing so you can remember what was discussed. So first of all, you have to list the keywords that will be used for systematic search. Uh, note down the useful words. These are synonyms which mean different ways of saying the same thing. This will help you create your search strings. Uh, you can also locate keywords below the abstract. Uh, then you will use the Boolean connector to form the search strings. Uh, sometimes if you have very complex search strings, you can use synonyms you have identified. Like for example, they are looking at buyer supplier relationships and the dark side. Uh, so they said that uh, we need to unpack this buyer supplier relationship. This we want to talk about buyer or supplier or vendor. And we also have to talk about relationship is also very complex. We want to talk about relationship, collaboration, cooperation, synergy, reciprocity. And dark side basically means that where uh, trust is breached, where people believe the other side and the other side uh, is uh, working on their own agenda. So they said dark, dark side could be corruption or conflict or negative or trust or decline or respect. So these are some of the words that come from the literature. So this is uh, so you can have you can start with a simple search string without any synonyms and then you can gradually add the synonyms to make your uh, work more refined. Always remember always start with the simple search string. Never start with the complex search string otherwise you can get in a, uh, you know you can get all sorts of articles which maybe you are not interested in. So I would suggest that when you are going to start your search first of all it would not be a bad idea if you can uh, look at the first simple search string would be buyer and supplier and interaction. These would be that would be the simplest search string with which you will start and see how many articles do you get. And then you can gradually add, you know, uh, synonyms one after the other and see how the number of articles increase or decrease. Uh, one of the disadvantages of using a very simple uh, you know, term is that you will get uh, a lot more articles because it will attract all sorts of articles from all sides of fields. So which you have to uh, uh, be aware of. But anyway, uh, the bottom line is, is start with the basic search string and then start adding these words as mentioned uh, in this slide also. 
that uh, start with the basic and then add the synonyms to make it more defined or complex. So this is an example that was shown here. Uh, then you also have to look at the choice of databases. Uh, so you can look at uh, different types of databases. I normally advise my students uh, to use these three databases, uh, which is ABI Informs or ProQuest or EBSCO or Scopus. Uh, so generally between these websites, your first cut search, you can also use Google Scholar, but that is for first cut research. As you know that now, most of the articles that are published are, own, are the, the, the publishing rights are with different databases so they own the rights so the university pays a lot of uh, fee for uh, on your behalf so that you can get access uh, free of cost to these databases so these databases basically you can say have the rights to share these articles with you if you want to buy these articles yourself these articles are very expensive they can be between you know ten dollars an article maybe to fifty dollars an article so you are not expected to buy articles on your own so don't go there uh, you are expected to contact your library uh, information scientist and they will help you uh, you know access those databases which you have the for which the university has the license uh, and that is a very big advantage for you guys to be uh, you know studying at uh, northumbria london campus because the uh, university is uh, paying a very heavy uh, license fee for you guys so that you can have free access to these databases so when you uh, paste your search uh, string in the database, it will give you articles. And the process is the same. Uh, normally, there's about a 40 to 50% overlap between these databases, which means that some of these articles are available in all the three databases. And uh, so you will remove the duplicates first. So if you download the list of articles, there is a function in each database, which actually helps you download the shortlisted articles. So you will paste them in Excel and you will rearrange them according to, you know, alphabetical, uh, their alphabetical order. And then you will eliminate the duplicates so that you have, uh, you know, the accurate, accurate number of articles. And then you will start reading their uh, titles. So first stage is to remove the duplicates before you start reading the article titles. Because, for example, if you have got 4000 articles, it is quite possible that out of those 4000, about 2000 articles are duplicate articles. So there's no point in reading the same title twice. So that's basically how you can eliminate it. Uh, so choice of databases, uh, of course, uh, is fine uh, as long as you have access to it. Uh, but the main thing is this, uh, that uh, you will see that there are certain papers uh, that we call as the, uh, you know, papers that you have, uh, uh, you know, um, are also in the gray literature. So gray literature basically means those documents which are not found through the systematic literature review. So in, 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 in this case, you will have the flexibility to include those unpublished, uh, sorry, unpublished documents which are, uh, you know, not published work. They might be in print or they might be on the internet. Like, for example, you might have consultancy reports consultancy, uh, you know, quality websites, government papers, uh, policy papers, white papers. Uh, those are also very important sources of literature, which you can include in, in, in your uh, systematic literature view, although they have not been found through the search strings. Uh, so but you can include them uh, in your search. And normally, I advise my student to have two third basically uh, from systematic literature review and one third can be from gray literature. So that means that if you have got 60 articles, you might have 40 that are coming from the published resources and one third can be from a uh, non published sources uh, like Internet based sources. But of course, this you have to discuss with your uh, supervisor, especially for those topics which are very new topics. It is possible to go and find articles which are coming uh, from other sources or from industry industrial uh, sources as well. So, uh, but remember, whatever literature you select, even from non published sources, you still have to apply the quality criteria on that. So it, that is absolutely vital. Uh, so you will, the process will be the same, you will first read the title, they probably will not have an abstract, 
So you will probably read a summary or something or introduction and then bring them down and then you will apply the quality criteria so that you are able to uh, shortlist your articles. Uh, so this is basically uh, some more examples of how to run searches and you can have a look at that. Then we come to the third stage, which is screening stage. Screening stages mean that how you are going to shortlist articles. So now that you have put the search strings in the search engine, you've got some articles. Now the process begins on how to shortlist them. So as I mentioned that for shortlisting, we use a two step process. Number one step is what we call as initial screening. And the second one is called secondary screening based on quality criteria. So initial screening is based on title and abstract based screening, uh, which in, is based on inclusion and exclusion criteria. So this is a, a sample inclusion and exclusion criteria that I have put for you uh, for your guidance. So inclusion, so inclusion and exclusion criteria means that only those articles will be selected, which meet this inclusion and exclusion criteria. So of course, uh, the, the good quality work done by students, uh, they also provide this rationale or justification for including this inclusion or exclusion criteria. So that rationale is the justification for the point. So they are looking at uh, peer reviewed journals only. So they are not looking at book chapters. They are not looking at conference papers. They are only looking at peer reviewed journals. So they want to maintain the quality. Uh, so their justification is this that peer reviewed journals are likely to have higher quality than conference papers or working papers. So as you know, peer reviewed basically means peers are basically subject experts working in the industry. So when you submit an article to publish, that article is reviewed by people who are expert subject experts in that area. So those are our peers and they have been, they review the paper and then the paper, if it meets the uh, criteria of uh, standard or standard set by the journal, then it gets published. So that's what we mean by peer reviewed. Uh, and that is their justification. At MSc level, you do have the flexibility then that you can include articles which are also conference papers or working papers in addition to peer reviewed journals. So we are a bit flexible here because of MSc uh, level, you don't have much time, uh, you know, to, um, uh, you know, go deeper in your uh, research. And also uh, because you are not making a contribution to knowledge as such, your primary contribution will be uh, contribution to practice. Uh, so uh, in at PhD level, because you have to make a contribution to knowledge, uh, you know, which is a requirement of PhD. So at that stage, uh, we, uh, you know, restrict our students to only peer reviewed journals so that they can make a claim, uh, you know, at the end of their PhD, but at MSc level, your MSc is applied MSc where you're applying knowledge to industry. So, and many of these papers, which are conference papers or working papers, they have fantastic uh, information source of information for application of theory. Uh, so you can also include those. Uh, then you can also put some limitation on since when you will select the paper. So this publication is since 1980. Uh, so this is like, um, you know, 42 years now. So but this will not be based on your own judgment. So you won't say, you know, I just wanted to look at the last 10 years. You must find a reference justification for why you are restricting your research from till 19 since 1980. So they found this reference. So, so this guy, Jonah Perro at all 2008 suggested there are limited supply chain searches before 1980. So you have to find a justification based on referenced work. Sometimes it is possible that your research is based on a topic which itself, uh, you know, lends uh, this justification. Like, for example, if you are looking at, say, for example, you know, uh, impact of uh, uh, digitalization on, um, uh, you know, consumer behavior in the post pandemic era. So post pandemic means that you are looking at 2022 onwards or 20 day 21 onwards. So that means automatically you are looking at generally those papers which are published more recently. Uh, sometimes it happens that uh, deciding with your uh, supervisor, you might want to look at a systematic literature review of last 10 years, last decade. So that means you are looking at those papers which are published in the last 10 years. 
but remember this justification must be clearly stated why you have limited yourself to a specific time period so this definite justification must be provided this is another area where student lose marks because there is no justification provided so you can't say you know i thought you know let's look at only 10 years so that's a weak justification you must provide justification supported by uh, these referenced uh, source uh, then, of course, uh, they were looking at specific type of studies like B2B, dyadic relationships and firm level relationships, and they have provided some reference there. Similarly, exclusion criteria equally important as inclusion criteria, because in exclusion criteria, they say that any non-English language journals will not be included because uh, the authors do not know uh, uh, because of their limited language capability, uh, which doesn't mean that uh, uh, you know the research is only happening in english speaking part of the world as you know there are many countries which are world leaders in research uh, but they are from non english uh, uh, regions of the world however we cannot include those journals because they have to be english language if the translation is available uh, you know uh, authenticated by the journal itself then that can be used but again this you have to discuss with your supervisor generally we limit ourselves to only non English, we do not include non English language journals. So try not to use Google Translator there. You know, if you have a if you have seen a like, you know, a, a, a very good article in your home uh, country language and you try to apply Google Translator, that's not acceptable. Uh, so just uh, stick to this uh, uh, no exclusion criteria that you are not going to include any articles which are from non English language journals. And then, of course, you can also exclude those articles which are not related to your area. So anything which you mentioned in that column, which says and not. So that can also be mentioned here. Like, for example, they are not they do not want to include articles which are talking about natural sciences, computer sciences and engineering. So that's why they have said this, that the, the discipline of this study is business and management. So these are not related to our work. So just provide this rationale. This will get you uh, this will raise the quality of your work to a different level. This is very important to demonstrate the just uh, to justify why you have used the inclusion and exclusion criteria. This inclusion and exclusion criteria will be used by you to shortlist your articles based on the title of your research and also the abstract of your research. That's what you are going to use for shortlisting articles based on title and abstract screening. So that's the first part of the screening title based screening and abstract based screening all right now we go to the second part uh, which is basically called the secondary screening based quality criteria so secondary based quality criteria i've given you a criteria uh, which you can use uh, for your work so generally what we do is this that we this is the quality criteria so only those articles will be selected which actually meet this quality criteria. So once you have brought the number of articles down to 75 or 80 articles, then you are going to read those articles and apply this quality criteria on those articles and uh, then select the final 60 to 65 articles which meet this criteria. So this, art, this quality criteria is applied to the full screening of the paper. Okay, this is not limited just to the title or just to the abstract. This is a different level. This is a second level of screening. As you remember, screening means shortlisting of articles. So the quality criteria is given at the top, starting from zero to going to three. Uh, three basically is a world-class article. Two basically is an article which is a very good article. And one basically is something which is uh, not meeting the criteria. And zero means that this element is missing in that paper so it is quite possible so the first thing is contribution to theory anything which uh, you know what is their contribution to theory means that are they bringing any new knowledge what is the the new uh, creation of any new knowledge in the in the paper uh, how have they used the theory in there have they used any theoretical framework have they used any theoretical lens uh, to talk about the issue in the paper methodology basically means so uh, methodology basically means how they have designed their research 
Uh, does it have enough detail about the methodology that was used? Uh, step num point number three is how they have conducted the data analysis and what were the results they got? What was the sample size? What were the results they got? Remember, this is quality criteria. So we will always add the word quality. What was the quality of data analysis? What was the quality of methodology section? What was the quality of their contribution to theory? Then what is the quality of implications for practice means? What is the benefit the industry is going to get from this publication? That is basically implication for practice. What is the benefit for practice or people working in the industry? And what is the quality of level of citations? Have they used citations which are uh, from journal articles that would get a three? If the level of citation is, you know, includes, uh, you know, non-academic sources in abundance, like web-based sources, internet-based sources, then uh, it will get a two. And if there is, is you know, the list is completely missing that that would be you know or you know it would be i would say even very few or limited i would say not absence because it will still have one if it is completely absent then it will get a zero uh, and then of course uh, you have to apply this criteria so uh, generally the the score is mentioned at the end of the paper so i will just show you um, a paper which actually shows this uh, a thesis which has applied this criteria so if you look at this i'm going to show you a sample on how to apply quality criteria. So this is a data extraction form that we will discuss a little in a little while. But if you look at the end part, last part, you will say quality appraisal score 2.5. So on a scale of three, they have given this article 2.5. So that means that this article is very good, almost excellent article. Similarly, if you look at this, another article. So this guy, they gave a two here. So if you can see quality appraisal score of two. So which means that it's a very good article, but could be better. But anyway, it's a good article to be used. So this student of mine, she works in Dow Chemicals now in, in Holland. So she completed her MSc thesis as a systematic literature review and her first job was in Dow Chemicals. So uh, by no means this is saying that a systematic literature review based thesis student who do a systematic literature review based thesis, they, have, they don't get any job opportunities. That's not true. So this is the last uh, I think last sheet. Yes. So this this student, MSc student, they they reviewed 80 articles. That's the last form, 80, form number 80. So the last the last uh, article that they selected, they got a score of 2.33. So again, this is a subjective score. This is based on your value judgment, but as long as you are con consistent then it's okay so again this you have to discuss with your supervisor uh, and it is possible that your supervisor can uh, blind mark uh, four or five articles and then you can mark the same just to calibrate your marking to be consistent so that uh, you know you know what is expected uh, now remember that there are certain articles which are not very strong in one section but might be strong in some other section so you can still include them all right so that is also possible like for example uh, like harvard business review is a very famous uh, journal in which articles are published but generally that doesn't talk much about the methodology uh, they are trying to look at implications for practice this section is very strong in that paper uh, so uh, many papers which are from academic nature 
they are not very practical in their approach but their methodology and their data analysis and contribution to theory is very strong so it is possible that uh, journal uh, the paper that you have selected or source you have selected might not be very strong in one area but in other areas very strong so you can still include it because you see that is your judgment if you feel that this article is useful for my research i want to include it then just uh, provide a justification for why you have given that score and then you can include that article uh, in your in your paper uh, then we go to uh, stage number four stage number four basically is extraction and synthesis so just uh, to uh, remind you what we have done so far so as i mentioned to you earlier that the systematic literature review approach has 10 steps which are divided in five stages so so far we have covered planning stage searching stage and screening stage so in screening stage we have just indicated that you have to uh, shortlist the uh, articles based on uh, initial screening based on uh, inclusion exclusion criteria which is step number five and also apply the quality appraisal criteria and shortlist the articles to about 60 articles so once you have shortlisted them to 60 or 65 articles, then we go to stage number four, which is called extraction and synthesis. And then we have the reporting stage, which is the final stage for uh, the systematic literature review. And that's uh, where my topic will finish today. So about uh, 15, 20 minutes of work left. So in the extraction stage, you have to use a data extraction form to uh, take the information from the those 60 articles that you have read. So for that means that you have to have a data extraction form, uh, which is like a template. Remember data extraction form is like a template that you will populate from the information you are getting from uh, the journal articles. All right, so it's like a template. So for every source that you are using, you must have one data extraction form. That's why when I showed you that uh, paper, that uh, MSE thesis, it had 80 data extraction forms, which means that it reviewed 80 sources. Now these are extraction form means, uh, you know, the information you have gathered from reviewing that particular source. So if you have got, uh, you know, 80 uh, sources, or in your case, you will have 60 sources, you will have 60 data extraction forms. So those data extraction forms basically are the evidence that you actually conducted the systematic literature review. So for example, this actually enhances the credibility and transparency of your work. So people who are doing going to do interviews, you, you, you have the evidence that you have recorded the interview, you have the transcript of the interview with you. If somebody asks you, can you please provide the, trans, the, the transcript of the interviews, you have it ready. You are not going to include that uh, transcript in the assignment in your uh, uh, in the appendix of your uh, MSc thesis, but it will be ready with you. If somebody asks you, you can provide that. Similarly, people who do a survey, they have actually downloaded or collected information from those surveys that people return to them, and they are stored in a in a in, in a cloud space. So you can download it and you can tell. Okay, these are the that is the information I have collected. So you have that evidence. But for a systematic literature review, you also need evidence, right? You can't come to the uh, to the class and say, okay, I've done a systematic literature review. I have looked at, you know, 60 articles. So where is the proof? So proof, basically, this is the evidence. Data extraction form is that evidence that you are going to write 60 data extraction forms, and you are going to put them in the appendix of your work. And this basically is that evidence that you will use. This is the raw material that you are going to use to write your thesis. So that's why, number one, it is used very useful for, uh, for increasing the credibility of your work. So generally, those students get extra marks, which actually include this in your MSc thesis. OK? So that this is the evidence, right? Without evidence, you cannot claim it. You can't say that I've done. So somebody can ask you, where is the evidence? So that's the evidence. Uh, and then, of course, uh, this data extraction form uh, must be. So after the completed data extra 
extraction form in add the data extraction form in the appendix of the thesis after approval from your supervisor so when you are going to add this in the appendix if the similarity rate goes up because of the data extraction form this will be disregarded why because this is the evidence you have selected so you cannot tamper with the evidence you can't change the title of the article you can't change the journal article title you can't change the information you are getting from the paper that has to be in this true form so this part of similarity will not be considered number one because it is in the appendix and because it is the evidence you are using and number two so that's the first advantage that it is the evidence the second uh, in, in fact, second and third advantage is this, that this data extraction will help you write two chapters of your thesis, uh, which is your descriptive analysis and thematic analysis chapter. Sometimes students put the two chapters together, but I normally prefer the students to have a separate descriptive uh, findings chapter and a separate thematic findings chapter. However, they can be combined together. So the second advantage of data extraction form is that it helps you write your findings chapter. So this is a, a sample data extraction form that I have generated for you. So you can use this. Uh, you can create it in a Word document or you can create it in Excel spreadsheet where you will have all these things in one column and then you will have one column for each of the 60 articles or 65 articles that you have reviewed. So you will copy paste information and you will paste it in the Excel spreadsheet and that's how you are going to populate this uh, 1 to 13 uh, fields. So as you can see, field number 12 is the abstract. So you will copy paste the abstract directly from the paper and paste it here. And then the, those are the keywords that I showed to you that appear just underneath the abstract. So that's basically your uh, the, the, these first 10 points that you can see. These are the ones which normally are used to write your descriptive findings chapter, which I'm just going to show you. But this is the descriptive findings chapter and then uh, the field number 14, that's basically what is going to help you to write your thematic findings chapter, which is based on your key findings, key themes. As you know, your research objectives are your themes. So if you have got five research objectives, you've got five themes that you are going to talk about. Uh, and then uh, this is what you are going to be using. And I'm just going to show you a few examples also. And then can you see the last field? which is quality criteria. That's basically what I was mentioning that on a scale of one to three, you can assign a number to each of these uh, of each of these articles. Uh, so uh, like, for example, uh, some of you might have uh, these objectives like to find the key factors, to find the challenges, to identify best practices, to examine the role of stakeholders and maybe to provide some recommendations. So these could be some of the themes that you are looking at. Uh, you know, so what you are trying to capture here through the data synthesis is that what do we know and what do we don't know? Both things are important for a systematic literature review that uh, what do we know and what do we don't know? So what is the limitation of your, uh, our knowledge? That is also very important. Uh, you can also do cross sector comparison and you can also do a cross function comparison. So cross function comparison basically means that, you know, how the different departments are working, you know, when they are uh, across the organization. So that would be a cross function comparison. Like, for example, you can compare operations or operations department with supply chain department, with marketing department, with sales department and see how different departments are working. Cross-sector comparison, as I mentioned to you earlier, can be comparison between different industries working in, in the work, uh, in, in, the, in, in practice. And now we come to the last stage, which is reporting stage. So reporting stage only will happen once you have completed the data extraction forms. Now you have to report the results of your analysis in your main body of your report, main body of your report. So reporting basically, so I have also given you a very comprehensive list. These are those points, eight points that you can use to create your descriptive analysis section. So time basically means the chronological distribution of the papers when they were published, who are the key authors. So you can say, you can make a list of top five authors, which journals in which the article was published, 
what was the organization field was it from finance marketing supply chain operations human resource project management it what was the paper type okay was it a, a book chapter was it a journal article was it a conference paper was it a working paper was it a website then what was the industrial context industrial context basically means that in which context was this paper uh, this research conducted uh, was it uh, on automotive sector or was it on retail sector or for pharmaceutical sector uh, then in that particular paper what was the geographical context was it based in asia or europe or usa or australia or africa and then what was the methodology they used was it quantitative research qualitative research was it a systematic literature review uh, based approach all those you can can do that and then in thematic analysis you basically have to link your work with the th research objectives so this is how you will present your uh, descriptive findings where you will have uh, you know a, a chronological like for example you will make different types of bar charts graphs pie charts to show the distribution of the articles that you have how the articles are distributed over these different dimensions uh, so as you can see these dimensions i have already mentioned these eight dimensions so these are those dimensions across which you are uh, describing the articles so the purpose of uh, descriptive findings is to demonstrate to the examiners uh, and your markers that you have uh, you know identified potential uh, trends that are happening in the industry or in the uh, in the industry like for example if you look at this trend it shows that the topic they have selected is is growing in importance and this is indicated by lots of publications happening in the last few years uh, similarly if you look at uh, classification by geographic location this shows that majority of the articles 29% of the articles are published in usa if you look at classification by sector they say 59% of the articles they do not mention they do not mention any particular sector uh, whereas 10% of the articles are on automotive sector then classification by document type so 44% uh, uh, of the articles 44 articles or rather 55% of the articles are like document reports uh, and then 31% are general articles 10% are government reports and some magazines they have also looked at so this type of analysis very quick to do but you have to record everything in excel spreadsheet uh, where you will have these eight fields in one column and then in the next 60 columns you will have one column for each of the articles so you will populate those articles and then you will create descriptive findings section or chapter and then the second thing is basically the recording of the thematic findings so i'll give you an example here so this basically is about uh, this last section of the data extraction form which is useful for conducting thematic analysis. So yeah, can you see thematic analysis section 14 key findings related to research objectives? And you can add other rows also. I've just given you just to show you. Uh, so if you look at this one, you will see that in the key finding section, they have written RQ1, RQ2, RQ3, so this RQ means research question number one, research question two, research question number three. So any information that you gather, which is related to your research question, you will copy paste it directly here. You will not paraphrase it. You will not write it in your own words. Why? Because this is the evidence you are selecting. This is the evidence you are collecting for from the article that you are reading. So just copy paste it in this way your speed of uh, link, linking your the work that you have collected from uh, the a journal article with your research questions is very very quick so it is possible that some articles will only talk about maybe one or two of your uh, research uh, questions remember these research questions are related to your research objectives and your research objectives are your research themes so this article is talking about two research themes. The first one is not talking about much in detail. It just um, barely mentions electric vehicles. 
so that's uh, basically so you will populate this information and you will uh, uh, include it in the journal article uh, data extraction form so this basically tells which article is talking about which research objective so then what you will do is this this is absolutely vital for your research and this basically becomes your uh, you know uh, very good table that you can include uh, in your uh, in your verb in your work which is going to go into your thematic findings chapter so as you can see that they have put the journal articles at the top which they have reviewed so you can see all the journal articles they have looked at they are at the top one column one after the other so and they've got multiple pages as i will show you but at least some articles are here and these are basically their research objectives so they are talking about globalization risk and then uh, governance mechanisms and something other so you will have your objectives here your five objectives or four objectives and you will have your articles here that you have reviewed the 60 articles and you will arrange them in alphabetical order and or maybe chronological order it depends on which order you want to follow and then you will map them across each other. So these are those articles, for example, globalization is being mentioned in these papers. One, two, three, four, and five. So these five papers, basically, they talk about this first thing, globalization. Then they go to the next one and next one and next one and they plot this. Uh, you know, these crosses actually indicate that in which paper, which type of uh, theme was uh, talked about. So how will you create this? You will create this based on this uh, data extraction uh, that you have completed in your data extraction form. So this is basically uh, that uh, evidence that you will use, uh, which is mentioned here in the data extraction form to mark this X that you can see uh, on this sheet. All right. So that's basically how you do that. So this is how you do the thematic uh, findings that you map your objectives against the papers that you have created you can put this in excel spreadsheet or sometimes people who uh, want to learn you can also learn and vivo which is another software for conducting this thematic uh, analysis uh, that you can also learn uh, you must approach uh, the it department uh, sorry, your library department, they might have some tutorials there for learning of NVivo, so you can learn that also. Uh, so, uh, however, it is not compulsory. Uh, you can uh, easily do this in Excel spreadsheet where you will have all these articles at the top and your research objectives here and you will mark these as themes. So, as you can see that there are plenty of gaps that you can, you have identified. So, these gaps basically are gaps in in literature or gaps in knowledge that you have identified so any kind of gap that you have identified you can claim this as a contribution uh, to theory that you have identified some gaps in knowledge and literature so as you can see there are man many empty spaces so these are all potential areas of future research whereas if you look at uh, those sections where you have got the crosses that means there's plenty of research which has uh, which is happening in this uh, part of uh, the literature uh, so these uh, this identification of gaps uh, through this mapping is an excellent contribution and if you can make this type of contribution that would be great so i'll just give you an example uh, just to show you how it is presented So I'm going to share my screen with you. So that's basically the paper that I showed to you again, the first paper. So if you scroll down this paper, which actually use the systematic literature review, if you scroll down now, you will see it's talking about planning, searching, screening that you can see inclusion, exclusion criteria and their rationale. So if you keep on scrolling down, that's basically the table that I wanted to show to you. So that's how your table will appear. It will look like this. In fact, I have 
I, I was showing you the screenshot of this one. So as you can see, the articles are here and the uh, objectives are here. So this is called mapping of the literature. Mapping means you are making a map between the objectives and where they have been mentioned in the journal articles. And as you can see, this sits right in the middle of their uh, findings uh, chapter where you can see lots of gaps that they have identified. These are gaps. So that's why this uh, paper is considered as world class because it has identified lots of gaps. So that's basically, and you can see it, although it, it has about 40, 50 articles and it goes over three pages. So a big table right in the middle. And this is one of the, the outcomes of uh, systematic literature review that you can look at. Yes, of course, I will I will share all this information with you. Don't worry about it. Uh, all this information will be sh I will pass this to Dr. Uh, uh, Sumesh and um, uh, he um, is always uh, very supportive of all the students. So he will be will be happy to share this with you. Uh, so that's basically the mapping of the field. So if you can create this kind of a map, that would be great. You will create this in Excel spreadsheet, which will be very easy for you then to translate into a Word document and put it in your findings chapter. And then you can discuss what are the main gaps of literature that you have found. These gaps in literature basically are also, uh, uh, you know, an indication where further research is required. So this, this is where actually, this is like you can say the culmination stage of one of the major elements of your systematic literature review. Then a couple of things that you must do is actually you must include uh, the data, uh, the SLR architecture. So architecture basically means that how did you reach those 60 articles? So as you can see that they say that, uh, you know, that basically looks at the stages of SLR, the five stages that you map the field, you form the panel, you identify business problem, then you do the keyword search, you find references. Then you do the title screening, then you do the abstract screening, then you do the quality control. After quality control, you do the extraction, then you report, and then you utilize. Utilize means you are going to make some recommendations to the industry. So here, as I mentioned to earlier, you can also learn NVivo, which is a software for doing thematic analysis. So I normally suggest this architecture, which I have used multiple times, uh, which actually is very simple to follow neat and clean you will start this you will say articles from search strings we started with 10223 articles first stage is to remove the duplicates we brought got them down to 5463 articles were removed as duplicates left with 4760 articles then we did the title and abstract screening got rid of these articles were left with 568 articles and then before we do the quality uh, full text based screening. This is where you can bring those articles which are from internet based sources. So that's what we call as articles from ad hoc selection. So internet based sources, web based sources, any company reports, websites, company websites, government websites like Office of National Statistics, Statista, uh, Wall Street Journal also has very good website. The Economist magazine also has very good website. You can also look at uh, World Economic Forum, World Bank, EU, uh, Office of National Statistics. These are very good, uh, you know, or um, uh, websites that you can use for data collection, and they will in be included here. So they will not be coming from your, uh, you know, from your search strings, but they will be added here. So you can add these two. Uh, I've also added this another box, which says articles from author-specific search. Author specific search basically means that there's a particular author who has talked a lot about this topic and you want to specifically look at that author's work. And it is possible that that author might have written book chapters or uh, maybe writes a blog or something. So you can include those in this part, uh, but you don't have to. But this is where you have got a lot of flexibility of including things which are coming from gray literature. This is what we call as the gray literature. Remember, I use, use the word gray literature. Gray literature. So that's your gray literature. So just uh, 
to show you. That's basically, can you see this word gray literature that I refer to uh, when you are selecting uh, uh, your databases? So that's what we call as the gray literature. Gray literature basically means these are those sources which are not published journal article sources. So that's basically we can include those also. That's your gray literature. But anyway, whatever you even comes from the gray literature, you still have to apply the quality appraisal. That's why this has to be entered before the quality appraisal. So everything which is coming from your sources, it quality appraisal is applied. We lost 34 articles here. We were left with 48 articles. These 48 articles, 40 articles were from search strings. Two articles were from author search specific uh, research. And uh, six articles were from ad hoc search, which is internet based search. And then this is what we will say 48 articles were selected. Or in your case, it will be 60. The reason why we have included 48, this work actually had more than 100 articles. But when we are submitting in journal, they have a word limit. You cannot submit an article which is more than 9,000 words. So that's why we had to cut down the number of articles because our uh, uh, reference list was like around 10 pages long. It the, Only the reference list had about two, 3,000 words in it. So that's why we had to cut, get rid of some of the articles. Uh, so this is another way you can present your work, which is this is more la latest way of presenting, which is called Prisma. So Prisma basically means this is another way of presenting your architecture, SLR architecture, this one. So the, you have one option like this one, and this is your second option. So many of my students are now using this technique. This is called a Prisma technique. Prisma means preferred reporting items for systematic review and meta analysis. So you have a reference here, which I will give you in the reference list. You can read this article also. So this is a flow Prisma flow diagram. It does the same thing, but it is from top to bottom. So as you can see, the first one is identification of articles like from Scopus and Web of Science. They then remove the duplicates. Then they do the title and abstract uh, screening. This is the screening first screening stage. Uh, then they do the eligibility, which is the quality control. They get 131 articles. And then they use some other, uh, you know, criteria, which they have mentioned, uh, include exclusion criteria on full text screening, some additional sources. This is the gray literature they are talking about. And they come up with 90 articles. So it's just the same way, but it is in vertical shape. So identification, screening, eligibility, and in Included. So this is Prisma. So you can either use this one, uh, looks more stylish, or you can use this one, which is looks more clear. And then you can, the last stage basically is what are you going to be your recommendations. So uh, as you know that uh, you can inform the research, you can have different types of reporting formats. This is the mapping that I showed to you. You can have a map of literature across research objectives. You can have a conceptual diagram. In Northumbria University, if you want to get score over 60%, then you must include conceptual diagram in your work. You must have some sort of conceptual contribution. Otherwise, very difficult to get marks over 60%. So try to have a conceptual diagram. Conceptual diagram basically means that it is a diagram which is informed by your research. And you are connecting different types of your research. What the outcome of your research should be in the form of a conceptual diagram. So I've given you a sample here where you can look at it when you have the time, when you get the slides. Uh, you can also have uh, a set of propositions. You can have a set of testable hypotheses. You can have a typology like two by two matrix. You can have categorization. You can have a decision tree. All these are things which can be used. Uh, you know, as part of uh, your uh, contribution towards the research. Uh, you can also identify knowledge gaps based on this mapping and any further research opportunities. So try to bring your work, in, bring it to uh, like a, to life and show it like this, something which is, uh, you know, connecting different objectives together. And then, of course, you the last, uh, and this is basically uh, my final slide before the reference list that you can also uh, give recommendations uh, to practice. 
so as you know that when you are giving recommendations to practice this will be a separate chapter recommendations generally is a separate chapter sometimes put people put it with conclusions also but i like to keep it separate it is a short uh, chapter maybe 750 to 1000 words so you can have three or four recommendations for each recommendation you will provide a timeline short term medium term long term when should this recommendation be um, adopted what are the resources required to successfully implement that recommendation these could be financial resources non financial resources like sales marketing operations human resources they will come from balance scorecard what are potential risks that the company can face and how can they mitigate them if they if they decide to follow your recommendation so i've given you a probability versus impact matrix here and then you will talk about potential risks and mitigation plan mitigation plan means how you are going to minimize the risk and last uh, is how to measure provide a mechanism for measuring the success of the recommendation like deliverables or kpis doing the red amber green analysis rag analysis so this is a rag analysis which is presented here with kpis uh, and in the end this is our reference list so these are some references which are world class references that you can use uh, for uh, completing the methodology section of your uh, dissertation if you decide to do an slr so that's it from this session uh, so thank you so much for your participation and uh, 